today as we come to the table. Sometimes in the times of our greatest pain, when God pours out His Spirit in the greatest measure, and we're able not only to endure, but to overcome. You know, it's interesting, I sometimes hear the term, even among Christian circles, that we need to learn how to cope with our situations. The Bible says nothing about coping as a Christian, nothing at all. The Bible only teaches overcoming. Coping is not an option for the believer. Overcoming is what we are given through the Word of God and by the power of the Spirit. And that is exactly what's happening in Israel's life, in Jacob's life. He's now living by the Spirit and he is overcoming in the Spirit and being called by the Lord, Israel. that you can overcome whatever challenges stand before you in life? With God, we know that all things are possible and that He empowers us to be victorious. No matter how difficult it may seem to do more than just get by, God wants you to turn to Him for the strength to overcome. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. Today, Pastor Mark will speak to the powerful transformation in Jacob's life and how we can learn from it. The enemy wants to identify you by your challenging situations, but God wants to deliver you. May we fix our eyes less on our problems and more on the King who empowers us to overcome them all. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Genesis chapter 35 with today's edition of Come to the Table. The warning for us is we need to make sure that we're staying in the center of God's will so that we don't suffer the consequences of moving when God hasn't told us to move and end up losing a child to rebellion or losing a wife or a husband to, to another person because we've, we've lost the affections and we have maybe find ourselves in a situation where we're unfaithful because we fall away. God says, stay where I've told you to stay until I tell you to move on. You've heard the terminology before, bloom where you're planted. <laughs> we need to learn to do that. And so... Here he sees, you know, the, the consequences of it. He goes and, and what happens? He, he makes this decision for his family. And now look what happens. In verse 17, it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, do not fear for you will have this son also. Again, trying to encourage her in the midst of her hard situation. And so it was as her soul was departing for she died that she called his name Ben-Oni, which literally means son of my sorrow. And so now she's dying. She goes, he's the son of my sorrow. What a horrible name to leave with your son. I know she was in distress. But can you imagine growing up? What's your name? Son of my sorrow. Ooh, what happened? Well, when I was born, my mom died. Oh, I'm sorry. And his whole life, there would be this. Well, Jacob didn't want that to happen. I love this. And Jacob, I believe, stepped in and did the right thing. Notice, but his father called him Benjamin, or we would say ben Benjamin. And Ben Yamin, what it literally means is son of my right hand. In other words, not only is he not the son of my sorrow, he's a special son. And he's the son that came from my beloved Rachel. And he's going to be my strength. That is the son of my right hand, which was a, typologically is a, a sign of the son of your strength. And so he says, no, this is not going to be the name. He's going to have a name that's going to be a good name and a name that he's going to remember the rest of his life as a good thing rather than a bad memory. Now, it's interesting here is he came to this place called Ephrath. It says it's Bethlehem. So another name for Bethlehem was Ephrath. Again, when the name changed or if the names overlapped, we don't know. But it's interesting as they approach this place and she has this child and she's losing her life here in the midst of this. It is interesting that throughout Rachel's life, a child was the number one thing she desired. The most important thing to Rachel all these days had been, I've got to have a child. She was consumed with it. Remember, she went to Jacob. She said, give me a child or I'll die. <laughs> Jacob said, am I God? I can't give you a child if God's withheld the child. But it's interesting to me because, again, we see God withholding this child here. What makes it really so ironic to me is the very thing she so wanted that God was keeping back from her is the very thing that took her life. And yet she had no way of knowing that, did she? In other words, 
she probably was saying, God, why are you letting everyone else do something that you won't let me do? Why does everyone else get whatever this is? You're doing this in other people's lives, but you're not doing it in my life. And God is saying, because it would destroy you. I know things about you you don't know. Others can, you can't. And sometimes I think we need to be careful as believers because we go to God and maybe even complain and say, God, why won't you answer my prayer? God, why won't you do this? God, why won't you do that? And God the whole time is sparing our life in some form and fashion, whether it's literally physical or whether it's emotional or whether it's in some other way, God is sparing our life. And I think when we have God's viewpoint, that changes everything, doesn't it? And so we have to have God's viewpoint and say, God, you know what? If you don't want me to have it, I'm not gonna have it. And I don't know why, and it makes no logical sense to me at all, but I'm putting my trust in you. And the very thing she so wanted, she was granted, and it ended up taking her life. You know, it reminds me of the children of Israel. It says they were crying out to God saying, why won't you give us meat to eat? What is this manna? Give us meat to eat. Give us meat to eat. The other nations have meat to eat. Why don't we, right? Complaining against God. And it said God gave them the desire of their heart, but sent leanness to their soul. And in their very desire, it was the thing that destroyed them because in their rebellion, they were judged by the Lord because of this. And so again, we need to understand that God knows what's best. You know, we've heard the term father knows best. He really does. Again, I'm not saying that Joseph and Benjamin were a curse. They were a blessing from the Lord and God blessed them with that. And and, and again, there's a number of factors that could have been the reason for this, but we need to realize that God knows better than we do in what he's doing. Now, it's interesting here, there is a side note I want to point out to you. Notice it says that her soul departed. There is a false teaching today called soul sleep that says that when we die, our soul goes to sleep until later on it's resurrected and we wake up again, so to speak, in the spirit. Not so. The Bible doesn't teach that. There's never been soul sleep. And even in this day, there was not soul sleep as she departed and she didn't go to sleep. And again, it tells us in 2 Corinthians Five, six through eight, it says this. Notice, so we are always confident. Paul speaking to the Corinthians. He said, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. In other words, while we're here, we're not with the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. But notice he says this. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So notice what he's saying. He doesn't say we are absent from the body and go to sleep. He doesn't say we're absent from the body and anything else or we just stop. He said, when we're absent from the body, we are present with the Lord. And so she now departs and she is joined, if you will, as the Bible says it in the Old Testament, gathered to her people. We'll see that again there in verse 29. And again, we see the names of the sons, uh, the name Ben-Oni then changed to Ben-Yamin. So Rachel died, verse 19, and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is a pillar of Rachel's grave, or the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. And again, there's still a marker there where they believe that Rachel died to this day, as a matter of fact, even still. And it says, And then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. And it happened when Israel dwelt at that land that Reuben went in and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Now, again, this means in a sexual way. What this means is, is that Bilhah and Reuben had an ancestral relationship. But it wasn't just incest. In this culture of that day, it would also be a sign of of the authority of the family. In the culture of that day, if someone was trying to establish their authority, they would have relations with the other authority's family member. And that would show that they were now the new authority and now the new ruler, if you were. And so no doubt this you know, could have had several different meanings here of what Reuben was doing. But no matter what the meaning was, this was the cruelest of cruel to his father. And one of the most deeply hurtful things that you could ever do. And it's interesting here how little it says about it. All it says is that he lay with Bilhah and, and Israel heard about it. You know, it's interesting. We see at the beginning of this chapter, and really in the middle of the chapter, there in verse 15, that Jacob is still called Jacob, even when he came to Bethel. And yet, remember, God gave him the new name Israel. And it's interesting, if you follow when God calls Jacob, Jacob, it's usually when he's in his flesh. And when God calls Israel, Israel, it's usually when he's walking in the spirit. And I think we both have the two natures that we fight with as well, don't we? And God has a new name for us. We may not know what the name is, but when we're living like the old person, God says, well, there's Mark. (laughs) I recognize that. There's Mark. And when I'm walking in the Spirit, I don't know what the name is. It's going to be sweet to find out what it is, but I do believe that God has given us all a new name. It indicates that in the book of Revelation when he's talking to the churches, the seven churches. 
But again here, it's interesting because we see Jacob being called Jacob when he leaves Bethel, which I believe was not really what God would have him to do. I think that was a move in the flesh. But now when it comes to all the pain, the suffering, the death of Rachel and Reuben doing this, he's been so drawn to the Lord by all the trauma that's in his life. Now we see that Israel heard about it. And I don't know whether or not Jacob was a violent man, but probably Reuben should be glad that Israel heard about it rather than Jacob. Because when certain things happen and we're in our flesh, we don't always handle it the right way, do we? But when we're in the Spirit, even when it's difficult, we're able to maintain. And that's a work of the Spirit, and it's a work of the Lord. But again, what's interesting about this also is that we see very little consequence in this particular instance. Just this almost passing mention. One verse about this ancestral relationship and this betrayal of his father and the pain that this would have caused. And yet when we get to chapter 49, we're going to see that when... Jacob starts naming the prophecies and the future of what's going to happen to, these, to his children. Reuben loses the right of the firstborn because of this, and the generations that follow him throughout their generations are cursed. And you know, it brings up a point, and that is oftentimes we think that we're getting away with our sin, don't we? And maybe even it seems like just a small sin that has very little consequence. Oh, there's just one verse of mention in our life. And yet there's going to come a day when we're going to pay for that. And it's going to bring consequences. Now, don't, don't misunderstand me. It doesn't mean God doesn't forgive us. He does forgive us. But there are still consequences to our sin. And some of those consequences can carry on lifelong. And now we see Reuben having his birthright taken away. By trying to take the position of authority on his own, he lost it completely. And again, that's another warning to us, is allow the Lord to do what he's doing in our life. Allow the Lord to raise us up and not try to take that position on our own. But not only did he do that, he passed on a heritage of cursing, you know, in a sense of, of, of to his children because of his unfaithfulness as a father. Now, again, I'm not teaching generational curses. I don't believe that applies to the believer. But at the same time, we see in this situation, he's going to have it in his generations because of this hideous act that happened with the one that the Messiah would come through, Jacob. And so we need to realize the seriousness of our sin will one day come back to bite us even if we don't understand it at the time. Now, Again, it just mentions that Jacob heard about it. But again, we'll see that um, I think, again, part of Jacob's passive nature. We don't know if he took any action beyond this. But certainly we're going to see that he does get the lack of blessing later on in chapter 49. But now notice also where it happened. It said it happened in the land of the Tower of Eder. Now, why is that important? Because the Tower of Eder was in what we call today the fields of, of Bethlehem. It was right outside Bethlehem, and this is where literally a tower of Eder means a tower of the flock, and it was the place where the shepherds gathered and watched over their flocks to protect them from predators. Isn't that interesting? The very place where he felt he would be safe from predators was the very place his son became a predator and betrayed him. And guys, understand this. When it comes to being believers, even among the family of God, sometimes you will be betrayed, even among the flock of God. I've heard people say, well, the church, you know, it's full of hypocrites or it's full of this and I'm not going because of that. The Bible says that the church is going to have sin in it. Jesus told us that. And the parable of, of the, the, the leaven mixed in with the dough they were making, the leaven represented the evil that would spread in the midst of it. We are sinners and even the Christians are sometimes going to sin. And then oftentimes predators come in that aren't even Christians that are going to cause problems. And that's simply part of what we expect, although it's not something that's fun, but it's the most painful, I believe, when it's among those where we don't think it's going to happen. And this is no doubt the pain that Jacob is feeling. Notice his life. He's lost Rachel. Now his son has betrayed him in, a, in, the, in probably the deepest level of betrayal that could happen between a son and a father. And now we see Jacob in, again, severe pain. But what I love about it is that when, he, when this happened, it was Israel that heard about it. You see, it's sometimes in the times of our greatest pain when God pours out his spirit in the greatest measure and we're able not only to endure but to overcome. You know, it's interesting. I sometimes hear the term, even among Christian circles, that we need to learn how to cope with our situations. The Bible says nothing about coping as a Christian, nothing at all. The Bible only teaches overcoming. Coping is not an option for the believer. Overcoming is what we are given through the word of God and by the power of the spirit. And that is exactly what's happening in Israel's life, in Jacob's life. He's now living by the spirit and he is overcoming in the spirit and being called by the Lord, Israel. I love it. Notice this says, now these were the sons of Jacob, the 12. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, Levi, uh, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Sons of Rachel were Joseph and Benjamin. 
The sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. And these were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. And then Jacob came to his father Isaac in Mamre, or Kirjath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. And the days of Isaac were 180 years. This guy had a good long life, didn't he? And Isaac breathed his last and he died. And note this, was gathered to his people. There's that terminology again, not going to sleep. Gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And his sons, note this, Esau and Jacob buried him. Now, why is that interesting? Because how sweet it is of the Lord, not only to see Esau and Jacob being restored in their lifetime after the falling away in the family, but Isaac getting to be around to see it. And as he dies, he looks up and he sees Jacob and Esau. And he goes, you know what, Lord, you are so faithful. The last thing he saw were his two sons, Jacob and Esau, gathered together around him and saying, you know what, Dad, we're here for you, we love you, and God has restored our relationship. Now, it doesn't always end that way, does it? But here's the hope we have as a believer. Note this. It may not end that way. We may have family separations that never get solved while we're alive and maybe even afterwards. After we go, the family may not make up. But you know what the hope we have as a believer is, is that God is always working toward that end. God is always working in our family, working toward that end for restoration and working to bring us back together and to use it as a testimony for his name. And so it's exciting to me and I think rather sweet here to see the Lord restoring this relationship and blessing him in his life. But as we finish this today, there's something I, I want to point out to you because as we end this story, we've seen a lot of death surrounding Jacob. And we said we were going to be looking at death and looking at hope. Where does the hope come in? Well, obviously, we know as believers, the hope comes in. And those that are in Christ, we have that hope of eternity. But there's also a beautiful picture of the gospel. The Bible says about Jesus that he's in the volume of the book. And what that means is everywhere you go in the Bible, if you look hard enough and pray, you should be able to find the Lord. This portion of scripture is no different. And I find it interesting, the parallels that the Lord has given us, because the hope that we have as believers is the hope in Jesus Christ. When our life is falling apart, when we have death around us, when we've been betrayed, whether it's physical death, whether it's emotional death, when we've been betrayed, when we're in the greatest levels of sorrow, that's where we have to remember in the hope of Jesus Christ and the hope of the cross. And that's exactly what this story tells us. How so? Well, you see, it was about 2,000 years you know, after this event and 2,000 years ago today that another man set out with his pregnant wife who was nine months along toward Bethlehem. And of course, we know that was Mary. And the baby to be born in Bethlehem was to be the savior of the world. Now, what makes this even more interesting is that the Bible tells us that she gave birth to Jesus there in Bethlehem and the father called him what? The son of my right hand. Even as Benjamin was born and called the son of my right hand. You see, the Bible says when Jesus ascended back to the father, he sat at the right hand of the father. And even today, Jesus is the son of the father's right hand. But the picture doesn't end there. Jacob, after that point, as you know, went on and was betrayed by one of his 12 sons. Of the 12 closest men in his life, one of them betrayed him. Even as Judas betrayed the Lord, one among the 12 the 12 trusted, the 12 closest, and probably the greatest pain that could be brought into the Lord's life was brought into his life at that time. But what's interesting is, as we talk about this also, is that where this Tower of Eder was located, the place where this event took place, and this is where we have hope, because this was the place of Jacob's greatest pain, the loss of his beloved wife, the betrayal of the close son, you know, and the, and the fact that he was cut so deeply was here at this field, this Tower of Eder. But remember where the field was. Again, this was the field of what we call today the shepherd's fields outside Bethlehem. And what's exciting about this, because in this very spot where the greatest pain that Jacob was experiencing his entire life with losing his beloved wife and the emotional pain of his son betraying him and all that was going on, and we see this picture here, that is exactly where the Bible says the angels came and announced the Savior had been born, Jesus Christ. And the shepherds there in the fields of the Tower of Eder hear the message that, yes, there's sorrow in this world. There's betrayal in this world. There's pain and there's hurt in this world. But a Savior has been born, and his name is Christ the Lord. And that's why we celebrate. But what's even more exciting about this, as God continues to lay the picture out, in that particular field, according to history, that is where they raised specifically the Passover lambs. 
And you see, the Passover lamb was the lamb that was sacrificed once a year at Passover for the nation of Israel so that all of their sins could be washed away through the sacrifice of the lamb. Why is this interesting? Because as you know, when John saw Jesus, he said what? Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so the Passover lambs that were born and raised in the fields of Bethlehem is the very same place that Jesus was born. And from those fields, they brought the Passover lamb to Jerusalem to sacrifice for the sins of the people. And from that birth, Jesus Christ grew and went to Jerusalem to die on the cross for you and I. And his blood was spilled as our Passover lamb. But it doesn't even stop there because three days later, he resurrected from the dead. And conquered death. He not only conquered sin, but he conquered death. You see, here's my point. Where do we find hope in death? Right here at the cross. Right where the Lord has brought us. Yes, we have death all around us. Yes, one day we're going to come to that place where we're going to be dying as well. But the exciting news is Jesus has gone before us and experienced death for us on the cross so that we will never experience death. Number one, we will simply move from this body to another. He paid for our sins on the cross if we will receive him as our Lord and our sins will be washed away and we have the hope of eternity and he resurrected from the dead so that death could be conquered and we could live with him in the kingdom forever. You see, that's the savior we serve. And so what's my encouragement in all this? I don't know what death you're going through today. There may be some physical death surrounding you. There may be emotional death surrounding you. There may be betrayal. There may be heartache unimaginable that you never dreamed. Jesus has gone before you, and in the midst of it, he has given you hope, but you need to run to the cross. And that's my encouragement to you this morning. Run to the cross where the Lord paid for all of it, and he will not only wash it away, he will give you the strength and the joy and the hope not to cope, but to overcome and to be victorious in Christ. Let him do it this morning. Let's pray. Lord, I pray this morning right now for some that may in this room be feeling betrayed. Some in this room who may be having the heartache and pain of a physical death that's very close to them. Lord, some in this room that may be experiencing an emotional death, maybe such as a separation from a friend or a family member or a spouse or whatever the case might be. But Lord, I pray right now you would draw them to the cross. Lord, all roads lead to the cross. And even as you have given hope in the midst of death to us while we live here, God, you've given us eternal hope through the death of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross for all who would come and all who would confess their sin and all who would repent and receive you as Lord. This is not the end. It is only the beginning And we have the joy in our hearts knowing that that's true now, but we have the joy and the hope knowing that that will be true for eternity. Lord, encourage your flock this morning wherever they are and wherever they're experienced, strengthen them. And God, let them ever be mindful that because you suffered on the cross, we now have that hope and that joy that is set before us. Let us fix our eyes on you and fix our eyes on the cross and the resurrection from the dead. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, our time at the table of God's word has come to a close for today. But what are some things you gained from what you heard? The book of Genesis gets the ball rolling, causing you to think about all kinds of big picture questions, things related to the creation of the world, why God would allow a worldwide flood, and why were the Israelites His chosen people. These are all good things to think about and to dig further in God's Word. But our hope is that what you heard today has helped solidify some things that might have been in question before. God was specific in how He brought things about. None of it was accidental or haphazard. As you listen through this series, We trust that you'll come to some great realizations about who God is and what He's done and is doing. To listen to this message again or share with a friend, go to thewaymedia.net. Once again, that's thewaymedia.net. Simply click on the Come to the Table tab. If you have some questions about what you heard today, we'd love to pray for you or answer any questions you may have. So reach out to us through the questions and comments link on our website or call us at 865-609-1385. That's 865-609-1385.
865-609-1385. Please don't hesitate to reach out. We encourage you to stay grounded in God's Word, allowing Jesus to grow you and draw you closer to Him daily, being willing to go where He's guiding you. Pastor Mark has prepared another teaching here in the book of Genesis. So join us again the next time we come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.